You're listening to the Pentaract Poetry Podcast, hosted by Anthony Etherin. Hello, welcome to episode six of the Pentaract Poetry Podcast. My guest this time is poet and critic Jonathan Bull. He is the author of Ex Machina, Clockfire, and most recently, The National Gallery. He is also the Poet Laureate of Hell. I spoke with Jonathan a few weeks ago and began by asking him what led him to poetry. You know, I, I have kind of a weird way into poetry, which is I sort of two ways into it. So the first original way I got into poetry was when I was young, I was uh, living in this very small, small town of like 100 people in this town. I would bust to like a high school. The high school had, you know, 300 people across grades 9 to 13 because we used to have a grade 13 back in in that day. And um, so very isolated. There's nothing around. If I wanted to see a movie in the movie theater, I had to drive for uh, like an hour and then cross into the U.S. Like it's incredibly an isolated uh, small town. So there's no music stores, no nothing. But... Uh, we had Columbia House and uh, was, you know, big at the time as mail or as CDs. And what I started to do, um, so one, I was just reading through the library because there was like a library, like one town over that where my mom worked. So I would just kind of get books from that library and just eventually I read through all the like almost every book in that library. So I just eventually got to the poetry books uh, in a certain, you know, so on one level, I just sort of started out of boredom and like for something to do, like trying to. Like I just started reading poetry because it was there. I remember the first book that really made an impression on me was this book called Black Night Window by John Newlove, uh, this Canadian poet. Um, but then the other maybe more significant way into poetry for me was I started writing down song lyrics. So uh, and what I mean by that is I would be listening to these record, these albums that my friends would like tape for me. Again, we'd all get CDs from Columbia House, but we'd all like coordinate to get different CDs. And then we'd record them for one another, like on cassette tapes. So I would have invariably like these, and it was, this is the grunge era when this is all happening. So I'm recording, listening to all this grunge music and I have, you know, no idea what they're saying. Like they're just, you know, it's grunge, right? They're mumbling, they're, you know, just screeching. Um, so I wanted to know what they were saying and I would just naturally, I would just, we had no liner notes, uh, right. And none of that stuff. So I would just sit, lit literally sit with my cassette and fast forwarding, rewinding and playing, rewinding. And I would write down all the things that I thought they were saying. And later on when the internet came in a, in a real way, one of the first things I would do is like, go look up like the actual song lyrics. Like what was Kurt Cobain actually saying? And I was never right. <laughs> So what I what I noticed eventually was I had all these things I had written down that were not the real lyrics. They were actually things I'd come up with. Like I was just writing down what I thought they were saying. But actually, it turned out that these were original, like artistic creations of mine by accident. Yeah. So it's I like got constraint really, poetry. In many respects, it was like constraint poetry because I was writing. I was kind of writing to this um, pattern that they had basically Again, I'm mishearing it, but it's kind of working like a mistranslation along the same like constraint rhythm uh, and with the rhyme scheme and all that stuff. And what I noticed was a lot of the time what I had written, mistakenly thinking they were saying this, I preferred to the actual lyrics. Uh, and I remember distinctly there was a Pearl Jam song called Oceans where I was probably, I think I got every word of that song wrong. <laughs> but I loved my version compared to his version. Um, and so I kind of, from that point, I thought, well, what, maybe I'll just write alternate lyrics for the songs that I love. So I started like writing alternate, like just intentionally doing this, uh, just writing kind of replacement lyrics for my favorite, you know, songs. And I was, again, listening to a lot of grunge and metal, like music that had this kind of real rhythmical pattern, but also like a surrealist um, kind of nonsensical uh, uh, word scheme in, in a lot of instances. Like, if you listen to what Kirk Cobain is saying, it's very surrealist in many respects yeah. once you separate the things out. And if you're talking, and, and again, I was listening to a lot of metal, it's very imagistic, it's very um, uh, disconnect, like, it's very much searching for a tone or an atmosphere more than maybe trying to say something that makes sense. Um, so, yeah, I've kind of started 
into po really I started as writing intentionally as a sort of accidental byproduct of mishearing song lyrics um and then really again then i started of course just writing my own kind of ima like imagined lyrics for like songs about music like i would just sort of just write my own poetry you know like you do uh, in high school and whatnot but i was very specifically kind of almost writing them in like again like song lyrics but for songs that didn't exist now and then i kind of transitioned towards i just kept getting further and further into things as a writer i was always really really interested in being a writer although primarily my primary interest is in the novel and i see myself in many ways as a sort of experimental novelist who's in, in some respects just doing something so strange that people don't recognize it as a novel and our best kind of understanding is poetry instead and i and then of course later on in life my big kind of movement uh into kind of what i may be doing and what people might maybe know me for if they know me at all came when i moved to the i went to calgary to do a phd and studied under people like uh, christian book um and suzette Mayer was my advisor robert majels was there uh, a lot of figures but but especially um uh, influential to me was again uh, suzette Mayer, my mentor and christian book um, who you, of course, you know and have talked to previously on yeah. this uh, podcast. And uh, Ex Machina, my first book, specifically came out of uh, talking to Christian, like just having conversations with Christian and kind of uh, him recommending things to me and uh, just kind of getting to know a lot of the writers in that milieu. In Calgary at the time when I was there was a very, um, Derek Ballyu was, do, you know, uh, as a person I really got to know well. And um, there's just a lot of excitement and things happening. And I just try kind of competitively to keep up. <laughs> yeah, did, did you always see yourself as an experimentalist or was it that environment that made you want to experiment more? Well, I was never really saw myself as an experimentalist and I, in many ways I still don't. Uh, but I think it's just because I have a, such a weird perspective on what I'm doing versus like how it looks when I put the things out. Like my joke about it is I I call myself a horror novelist, but nobody agrees with me. You know, uh, and from my point of view, I'm just trying to do what the project demands. And so I'm not interested in developing a personal style that I carry from book to book. You know, which, of course, becomes a marketing problem for, you know, an author trying to, you know, be an author. But I'm just not interested in the kinds of things people are normally interested in, uh, like, you know, having my own personal style that people can recognize me for. I'm interested in a project. So I get like a project in my head and I pursue the project. And I'm just interested in extending what I like. The way I like to put it is I, I want to go to the end of the idea. So whatever is inherent in the project or the idea, I just need to, I feel like I need to take that to its extreme end position. And often for me, that involves um, experimental techniques and methods, if only because I learned a bunch of them. Uh, I think probably one of the great influences on me from a figure like Book uh, or the other writers I was encountering in Calgary was just this commitment to whatever they were doing, they were very committed to doing it. And I kind of would change what I was doing, uh, but that idea of being just fully committed to whatever I was doing right now, I think is something that I really uh, served. And, and just on a different level, I just find experimental techniques more interesting uh, on, a, on a basic level. Like I get very bored with, um, I, I remember distinctly when I was writing more conventional kind of normative poems, winning an award, uh, a sort of minor award for one of these poems. And I, I got the kind of award and I was, it came in the mail with like the check and everything. And I was just totally unemotionally interested in it whatsoever. As soon as I got it, I was like, well, I guess I've learned to do this and I'm just done with it now. <laughs> and so I needed something else to do. And at the time I got, um, I got, again, I was applying to PhD programs. I'd gotten uh, an acceptance, uh, two different acceptances. I was trying to decide which one to take 
because they were equivalent in terms of the money and my, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do precisely. I had this, these two different people I could have worked with. Um, and what I, I just sort of looked at my bookshelves. I just counted like, where are these people from? Uh, Cause I, I don't keep a lot of books. Like I, unlike a lot of writers, I get rid of books very you know, quickly after I'm on, but I, I do keep some books. Um, so I, the, are the books I kept and, you know, I just had a lot of Calgary authors on it. And, you know, I had books like, you know, yeah, there, and I thought, well, I'm going to go to Calgary, I guess, <laughs> because that's where my favorite writers are. Um, and so it just, I just have always been more interested in the kind of non-standard thing, whatever is the, uh, the more non-standard thing, it just interests me more. Um, and I just find it's those unusual techniques are most helpful for, to me just with the projects I've selected for whatever reason. Like I just, again, I just want to always just find the, what's the core of the thing? What is it in its essential core? And how can I extend that as far as possible yeah. before I abandon it forever and move on to some new thing? With, with that in mind, how did you go about writing Ex Machina? Well, it, it sort of initially came about as a procrastination from my PhD project. <laughs> like I had this... PhD project I was doing um, and I just you know as you sometimes will do when you have something to do you just kind of start wishing you had something else to do <laughs> like I just wanted a lower pressure thing to work on for fun I was writing these very lengthy pieces I wanted to write shorter pieces um, but primarily the core of it though was um, yeah Christian Book had talked to me about um, Erewhon for whatever reason we were taught he, he had brought up Sammy Butler, Butler's Erewhon and um, I had gotten a hold of it and I was reading through this book and I came to the chapter uh, the two chapters where he talks about the, the book of the machines so it sort of started with this um, set of quotes from the book of the machines from Sammy Butler's Erewhon where he describes a sort of utopia where they've outlawed machinery and one of the reasons is that they see um, they see this machinery as evolving into a consciousness eventually and that becoming problematic. So it's this very, it's like this Victorian novel that is um, in some ways prefiguring the kind of paranoia that you see in the Terminator series. Um, and he gets into at one point, um, I was also reading a lot of Marshall McLuhan and, and he gets into, they get, they were getting into a lot of the same um, ideas, which is that if you look at things from an outside observer, uh, an outside alien observer would perhaps see these machines as the dominant species on the planet because all the things we do are in service to these machines. We reproduce them. There's these quotes about like uh, that. Again, I reproduced an ex mock and uh, like direct quotes from the book where or one of the figure characters in, in Erewhon is explaining to the narrator how it seems like machines don't have a reproductive process and therefore are not like, you know, living organisms that evolve. But if you look at it from a different point of view, uh, we are part of their reproductive process. It's just like a bee is part of the process of a flower's pollination. Um, we're part of the reproductive processes of these machines. And it just started to occur to me as I was reading this book, books themselves operate in a similar fashion. You know, I was feeling like kind of, you know, enslaved to this dissertation I was trying to develop, you know, all my kind of mental time and energy was going towards this project. And I it was starting to feel oppressive again. So I was looking around for something to get away from it from and procrastinate with. And so I sort of ironically end up and end up in service to this other book idea um, uh, where, again, if you just take God out of it, if you take the deus out of, you know, out of the machine, it, you know, it, you end up with this ex machina, this idea that, um, you know, everything's coming out from these machines and we're just part of this process reproducing these in this case i started to, you know book machines so part of it was also i was taking a class of the christian book we were going deep into pataphysics um and so is in many respects a kind of outgrowth of that class and the kind of things we were kind of thinking about learning this imaginary science how do, how do you and, and i was trying to think of well maybe i could contribute to that sort of you know, pataphysical project uh, in, in that sense. And I started combining with things like this choose your own adventure books I used to love and all sorts of other weird, you know, again, just kind of pulling my weird synthesis of influences together.
Yeah, the choose your own adventure aspect is fun. How many different ways are there to read it? You know, I'm not quite sure, but there's three core directions. Like when you start, if there's two core ways to read the book. One is, of course, following the numbers, you know, going uh, along the path, at which point, and if you do that, if you do follow the numbers and read the book as it basically tells you to read it, um, at a certain point, there's like three core lines that kind of, there are moments where you cross from one to the other. Um, so I'm not quite sure precisely how many paths there are, but there's a few uh, ways in which you cross from one path to the other at certain points, but, but they always loop. There's no terminal position ever. You always are looping endlessly in these different ways. But uh, so that so one way to read the book is if you actually do what it says and follow the numbers, in which case you'll you'll loop in different respects and you'll just kind of, you know, it'll keep moving in a different pattern, but there's no terminus. But you also will never read the whole book because certain pages are unlinked. Oh, they give the appearance of how being linked or certain pages are specifically like uh, posited as outside of that programming. Um, so I, it's sort of in some ways a bit of a weird you know, joke that if you follow the book, you'll, you'll, you'll never read the whole book, even though you'll read it forever. Uh, and if you break uh, out and just follow, you know, and, and just read like like a normal book, uh, you'll kind of cheat yourself of that experience, but you'll actually read the whole book. <laughs> So it's kind of a weird, um, so it starts to sort of reflect back to you in a certain sense. Um, uh, what are the choices you're making as a reader? And then various of the poems will actually explicitly kind of bring uh, a lot of the poems, if not, you know, almost all of them are just meditating on themselves or on your position relative to them um, or, or, or operate as a weird sort of little puzzle where you know, you're trying to figure out maybe what it's exactly about, but it, if you think, but it actually is just describing how many objects are on this page uh, or what have you. Yeah. Well, I enjoyed the book very much and uh, it's currently free, is it not? Yeah, I've, uh, through some weird um, accident, <laughs> I just maintained the ebook rights to this book. And so it is, oddly, although it is, is basically a hyperlink text it has never appeared as a hyperlink text um, because they never put out an electronic edition of it but uh, the book's been out for last year it was the 10th year anniversary of the book and so at that point i decided i'll just if you know i'll make an ebook version of it and just put it up on my website for free for people because i didn't want to be selling it necessarily and competing with my publisher because the book's still in print um uh, but also it's like not necessarily liable to really you know sell a million copies or anything so i thought like the best way to kind of um uh get the book out there more but also like not undercut my publisher who's you know still trying to sell this book would be to just you know kind of throw it up for free to the people who maybe uh would be interested in it but don't have access to the book for whatever reason um so yeah so it's just at my website at uh, you know jonathanball.com you can get a hold of ex machina freely and again, and again, this is the ebook version where it is hyperlinked and you can kind of start following it in this weird pass. What do you generally think about uh, giving work away as a, as a, I suppose, a marketing strategy? I think it works and also is of works less and less well the, uh, the more people do it, if that makes sense. So I think we may have hit a point now where it barely works. <laughs> and you're probably, if, if I was just purely trying to, you know, get people to like uh if it was purely going to try to do it as a marketing point of view i think i would want to take it down and put something else up like that people would be more interested in reading like fiction for example um, which i guess i'll eventually do uh, as you know i gotta I, i'm more fully doing fiction and what have you but uh but i don't know i just want to like so I, I think in some ways it is a good strategy and in other ways it is uh too common a strategy at this point, if that makes sense. Yeah, I've uh, I post a lot of poetry on Twitter, and yeah, and, so, and there are definitely people out there who aren't buying my books because they can just get my poetry free. Yet at the same time, it's by doing that that I've built up an audience. Well, I've got your book here, your Stray Arts book, and um, what I think is, I mean, maybe I'm wrong. You can tell me as a publisher. <laughs> to me, like putting your Twitter feed. Uh, or that kind of thing that's free, but then there's like a hardcover 
like a high quality hardcover. Yeah, that's what for it people who like. really care. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I think a, a genre like poetry or like or the kind of even just the weird kind of stuff that I'm interested in doing, uh, even if it's not poetry, like even when I do fiction projects, I feel like I feel like readers are such a niche market in that anyway. You might as well just I don't really understand why there's people are still doing paperback like low quality paperback books. I feel like a high quality paperback book like my publisher Coach House does or like a high quality hard covers makes sense. Yeah. Giving stuff away for free makes sense, but everything in between I don't think makes sense. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm not a massive publisher, but uh, my sense of it is re- readers of this kind of work are such a small uh, market anyway that I'm just I don't see why anyone would bother with the casual side of that market. <laughs> you know, you might as well just, you know, focus on people who really, really, just like you, are just obsessed with this stuff and just, you know, want to, would love it. And therefore, you know, maybe would, you know, pay more for a nice hardcover, even if they could get it all for free. So I feel like for the very specific thing I'm doing, it makes sense to be giving, you know, just stuff away. And then I, I don't see like, a sensible business model that for me that is based on selling books. <laughs> so for me, it's like, that's another reason I feel like there's no point ever watering down anything I'm interested in doing. I might as well just make it as weird as possible <laughs> and as yeah. wild as possible and just go as far as even like past the point where I think anyone would be interested in it. If that's where the project wants to go. Yep. People, uh, people don't, really go for poetry so that frees up poets to to do whatever they want uh, well when cockfire came out i remember like i specifically was like telling people it's 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 poetry for people who hate poetry because i was try- doing almost the opposite of everything that i saw so, other people doing in poetry you know i mean you've got your rupee cars and your other um ways in which poets poets have um you know broken into a, like a mainstream but i don't really see that as significant from uh I mean, it's even a really weird thing to say, but I don't see somebody like that as significant from a um, business point of view uh, because they're outliers. Uh, and I think the mistake publishers often make is looking at outliers as if they were reproducible successes. So now we see all the clones of Car, for example, um, which is, you know, I have nothing against that work precisely, but it's just that it's a different it's kind of like it's 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 poetry for people who don't read poetry which yeah. is fine there's nothing wrong with it uh it's like in some ways like a it's like a beach read version of you know like like it's like the novels that are the beach reads they're not really for real readers and they're and it's not a market i think is sustainable to chase because you're trying to as like sell books to people who don't buy books or who own 10, buy 10 books in their life. I've never understood why publishing, like I read uh, 95 plus books a year and I buy you know, almost all those books. Like I, I spend way too much money on books. I'm a person who will buy like two, 300 books a year and read 150 books a year. I don't understand why I'm not the person being marketed to as opposed to the person who buys two books a year, 10 books in their lifetime. But that's who, you know, the big five publishers wants to want to sell books to. I have never quite understood that. So to me, it's uh, the Internet has sort of changed the way you can approach that stuff. But uh, as a writer, I think it's hard, it's bad to think too much about it. I think as a writer, you just need to kind of be serving the project and serving the book. And as soon as you start to think about how I'm going to market this thing uh, and make artistic decisions on that basis i think it's it's i think it's just a, a snake eating its own tail at that point you're absolutely right that you you create whatever you want to create and then you have to find a way to mm-hmm. get people to buy it rather than try to make something for people uh, but with that in mind there, there still has to be some way that you can try to convince people to read your books how would you go about that you know that's a good question that, that I think everyone's every writer is trying to answer. My my sort of solution and weird is maybe a weird solution and it's maybe not the uh, the best solution, but my basic solution is to not uh, really try that hard. Uh, and I don't mean that I don't want to market or get behind the books necessarily, but like I just feel like 
I need to make a book that on its face of it is interesting, if that makes sense. Uh, so I just try to like as much as possible, like put into the book, uh, like make it exactly how I think it needs to be and trust that it will sell itself in a manner of speaking. Uh, and like I'll do things to try to promote the books, but I feel like um, I need to feel like it's a good idea for somebody to read this book <laughs> that it will like benefit them. Like they will get something out of it as opposed to, I need something from them. They need to buy this book for my own purposes. Does that make sense? Like, I feel like if I just like, so, I mean, it's, it's easier for some books than for others. Like Clockfire is very easy to explain what it is in a sentence. It's, you know, plays that are impossible to produce. So you, you want to read it or you don't right like you want to read plays that are impossible to produce or you don't want to read plays that are impossible to produce you know you want ex machina like you want to read a choose your own adventure book about how mach of poetic statements about how machines have changed what it means to be human or you don't uh, and so to me it's just about figuring out like this is something i do in the editing process uh, especially because i'm very uh I, I spend most of my writing time in the editing uh, part of like the editing part of it um, just really trying to rewrite and revise and make it uh, the way I put it is I want the thing to be what it is so as at a certain point in the creative process I need to figure out as clearly as possible what is this thing that I'm working on and then once I figure out what it is uh, like in its essential core it is x um, I just do everything I can to make it more x and less y <laughs> you know, and everything I do from that point on is about making it more what it is and less like other things that maybe have influenced it or that I'm more used to or what have you. And I'm just trusting that at the end of that whole process, uh, I've got it very clearly what it is and people will want that or not want it. And it's just about finding the people who want X now, as opposed to trying to convince people they should want X. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a it's a very good way to look at it. Uh, well, what do you think about the use of social media? I think it's worthless. Uh, I mean, your example though of a person who ha proves this wrong. So before I get into my particular <laughs> belief on social media, I'll just I want to preface it by saying you've sort of disproven a lot of my opinions <laughs> in some ways. <laughs> But I think social media is is nearly worthless as a marketing tool and is not f uh, going to sell books. Now, it seems to me that you're an outlier or an exception there. And it's maybe, you know, again, because I do know people who I mean, I come to your work through Christian book telling me to read your books. But for the most part, I think uh, I don't know if, how common that is. <laughs> you know, I think. Um, I think a, a lot of people like, come to your work, of course, through, you know, social media. Um, I don't feel like it's for I, th I feel like for most writers, social media is that doing them harm uh, rather than good uh, because by wasting their time and just making enemies. <laughs> if well, that yeah, makes that sense. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, um, I think if, if you if you I just don't see like for most people it being a benefit. So I'm barely, I mean, I'm on it. I'm barely on it, but I am on it. If I had a better way of doing it, I might feel differently. I think you've kind of found a better way of doing it. I'm not sure that I have. And I feel like, I'm always thinking like there must be some, every once in a while I go back to it and think maybe there's some better way to do things. But uh, I'd rather ask you that question. Like, how do you find social media works uh, or doesn't work? Like, what do you think the opportunities are there? Because I just see so many ways it's, it drains but maybe that's why I'm, you know, not successful with it, relatively speaking, because I don't like it. <laughs> maybe that's just, you know, undercutting things. I just think there's too much emphasis on it because from the point of view of marketing, I think it's a nice thing to, like, connect to people potentially. But I don't see it as a thing that's valuable as for marketing because I don't see the proof that it sells books. Well, I, I mean, definitely the best thing is the contacts you can make. And, you know, like I said, I, I have built an audience just by posting poems. Uh, you're absolutely right that it's too easy to make enemies. So I, mm -hmm. I try to 
keep my opinions to myself and just just post poetry i find that it's just like it's become a weirdly toxic space where um you could have the most banal opinion and uh for some reason it's angering people yeah but i think that there are people i see using it you know in a way that is you know again more supportive of you know, building relationships with people and, and like having positive interactions with people. I just don't quite understand. I just am too tired to do it, I guess, in a, in a sensible and meaningful fashion. But I think really like I, I the thing I think is uh, maybe the best use of social media is just trying to get on there and like help people. So like if I am on social media at all, I try to just like, you know, if somebody's asking a question, can I answer the question? Or, you know, is, can I like point them to some resource or give them a recommendation if there's, they're asking for recommendations or what have you? Um, I don't think it's a great place to like be advertising or selling things. But that said, you know, if you had a budget for it or something, I guess it would be different. But uh, I don't know, like I just, to me, like it's just, Everything, especially because I've got small kids and, you know, and, and I'm doing much of other things. I just find like my time is better spent working on the books. And just trying yeah. to then just figure out who would love who wants this book, you know, who wants this book that is X. And uh, I guess social media in theory can be helpful for that, but I don't see it realistically as super helpful for that. I think what's more helpful is things like a podcast or a, a blog or something, something that has a smaller readership or smaller, you know, audience, but maybe they have, like, it's a more defined audience that has, like, say, um, a more clear interest. Because I'm not, I mean, I'm not writing s books for everybody. That's, that's patently clear. <laughs> you know, it's, I'll write a poem about, I'll write sonnets about Leatherface from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, right? Like, it's, you know, a, a arguing that Leatherface is the hero of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Like, there's a very small group of people who want that thing. Um, it's never going to be like Rupi Car status. So I don't. So I'm not going to get on Instagram like Rupi Car is, right? Yeah. She doesn't have much to say about Leatherface. <laughs> I don't. Not that I know of. But like, you know, I mean, I'm sure there's some weird, fun way I could use social media to promote that kind of thing. And as soon as I find it, sure, I'll try it out. But to me, like. There's already people who like Leatherface. It's just a matter of figuring out, like, well, are there any of those people who would be interested in, like, you know, is there a place where somebody's talking about Leatherface poems already? And people are listening to it, you know, and so on. Like, that's probably a weird example, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, um, I also just, as short as my stuff is, I feel it's just kind of too long for a lot of social media. But all that said, I just don't know what I'm doing on social media is maybe what it boils down to. Because I'm just too old. I'm like that weird generation that's just slightly too old and got the tech just a little behind everyone else because I was in a small town. And I just don't quite understand certain things. So I've got a bit of like that out of touch white guy uh, thing I, I, in my DNA, I have to admit. I don't know who Harry Potter. I don't know who Voldemort is, for example. Earlier today, I missed a joke my friend made about Voldemort. And I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> because I don't know anything about Harry Potter. Well, I didn't know uh, how to how to use social media when I started. I was 34 years old when I signed up to Twitter. And I, I had no idea what I was doing. I remember so... texting. When texting first became big, my friend, uh, the great writer called Salima Nawaz, was like, texted me like, hey, you want to go to this concert? And I was, for about a week, I was furious that my phone was broken because it had this like little envelope that I had a message, but I didn't have any phone messages. And eventually I figured out, oh, it, somebody has sent me a text message. So I read the message and then I call her back a week later. <laughs> and she's like, no, she's like, when you get a text message, you're just supposed to text a person back instantaneously. <laughs> I was like, well, I don't know what you're talking about. And uh, like, that's to me like... I mean, I'm only 40 years old but, uh, right now, but like, I just, that's how I, you know, and I, and I like, I don't know. I feel like I'm, I'm on this weird line of like, because I've also have a 20 year old daughter. So like, I've like kept up to date on like what music kids are listening to <laughs> and what the kids are doing these days. But also like, I can barely like use my phone 
and I don't know how what social media is all about. Like I'm kind of in that weird in between space. So you know social media, but you hate it. <laughs> kind of, yeah. I mean, I'm trying to not hate it because, but it get, it's hard these days. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that suits me with Twitter is that the way I put a project together is I work on small projects and then I try to find a way to combine them to put them into a book afterwards. And I guess from what you said before, that's, that's the opposite to the way you do it, that you come up with the one overarching concept and then you have to fill in the gaps, so to speak. Yeah, generally speaking, I mean, I'll, I'll always be like picking away at smaller things, but I think broadly I, I have this big idea I, or I'm getting to a point, I'm just playing around and trying to get to a point where I have a big idea in a manner of speaking. And then, then yeah, it's just, to me, it's about getting an architecture figured out. As soon as I've got a, an architecture, which, you know, it may take me any amount of time or writing to get to the point where I have like an architecture of sorts. Um, and at that point, I just start slotting things into the architecture. Uh, and, and I, I think in some ways it's a very much, uh, it's a process when I was young, my two favorite authors were Stephen King and Salman Rushdie. <laughs> and I've always been interested in like that tension between uh, this kind of fast moving, visceral thing that's pulling you along and maybe it's sloppy and messy, but is, you know, it has a has a an atmosphere and a pull and this kind of more clinical architectural space where perhaps it's not clear how things connect, but it's clear that they are all within this space in a patterned manner and so by the time i start to meet people like christian book and like uh get introduced to um you know again these more experimental conceptual uh ways of working uh, i just had I'm, I'm very still i think very interested in this tension between like a, a kind of overarching architectural concept and this more visceral way in which you're kind of breaking out of the concept. Like, I really want to make an architectural, uh, tight, uh, controlled space. And then I want to find ways to like smash that space apart and kind of like brush up against it in, in, in weird respects. So like, I want to write sonnets, but then make them about Leatherface, you know, <laughs> like I want this kind of, uh, structural thing and then make it, um, then I start loosening it up in particular ways. It's like in the Leatherface sonnet sequence. This is in my book, The National Gallery. There's a series called uh, Leatherface Retrospective, and um, so it it goes. It's a it's a series of sonnets. Most of them are kind of loose, that just have a rough rhyme scheme, or maybe they just have 14 lines. But then some of them have you know tighter metrical patterns. Um, it's sort of a range of things. Uh, uh, but they all sort of have a few minimal constraints, like the 14 lines, the Shakespearean kind of uh, uh, stanza structuring with the kind of, you know, Volta-like turn at the end. They'll have, I'll have like a minimal level of things I'm going to do across the sequence. I'll tighten it up in particular places or as I go, like uh, to prove that I can do it, <laughs> you know, to like any naysayer, traditional sonnet writer, I'll just prove that I can do it properly at one point. And then I'll be more flexible at the other points, perhaps, as suits, you know, my uh, the con what the poems are supposed to be about on a certain level, which is, um, you know, these cannibals as these strange sort of artists. If you take away our moral judgments, if you if you want Texas Chainsaw Massacre uh, is an interesting example to me because one, uh, I'm fascinated with horror as a genre, and and I do in many respects, consider myself a horror author. Uh, but two, if you watch that film, the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, almost nothing that the cannibals do in the film is illegal in Texas today um, due to stand your ground laws and so on. And, you know, other, right up to the point of cannibalizing a person, everything is legal. Um, uh, and so even like from a legal point of view, most of what they are doing would not be seen as, you know, wrong. And from the film's point of view, I think it's the most, ex it's this extremist film that is positing that the universe is this nightmare slaughterhouse. And it's wrong to think that everything is confined to this house and this family. This is the rule. Uh, and you have like these weird sorts of ways in which 
you know, the film is engaging with these very strange concepts. So I'm very interested in like the avant-garde tradition of um, uh, this kind of radical interest in, you know, extreme material, um, but also in these kind of more experimental techniques or like moving within a tradition, but also kind of against the tradition. And any time there's like a tension like that, I, I really am interested in exploring like that tension. So I'll often do like an experimental technique, uh, but instead of doing it precisely, I'll mimic it uh, so that people think I'm doing it, but I'm not really doing it. <laughs> you know, I did that in my Politics of Knives books, for example, like there's, there's a title poem has all these blacked out sections. So it looks like an erasure poem where I've taken a text and erased sections. Um, but it's not that at all. I'm just using these black bars to suture together different sections and use them in place of line breaks in many respects. Like, I'm very interested in those kinds of, like, setting up these weird architectural tensions. Yeah, that's fascinating. I mean, do, do you ever work with stricter constraints? I have. I, I have. I find that I'm not as good. So so often I'll do it, and then I, I won't publish that work uh, just because I don't feel it's quite... Uh, like, I really admire the kind of uh, stricter constraints that, you know, you work with, uh, particularly anagrammatic constraints and palindromic constraints. Your alien drone is really interesting to me as well. But, like, what I find when I do that work is it gets – it's too tight and too controlled, and I can't break out of it um, far enough. So uh, I find, like, flirting with that kind of constraint is more productive for me Um than adhering to it um but i i really admire a person who can adhere to it um and can still like get a, a kind of interesting kind of visceral uh, tone again like i come to poetry kind of through heavy metal and grunge music in a weird sort of way and so the atmosphere and the tone to me is more important than anything else and that kind of visceral uh reactiveness um but uh, I, I just want to try to accomplish like all this within a kind of architectural controlled space in a weird sort of way. I'm wearing my Pink Floyd shirt under this sweater <laughs> and like uh, uh, that, that kind of like concept art uh, versus like a grunge, you know, uh, aesthetic. Like I, I kind of have a bit of both, you know, the prog rock and the punk influence, you know, on me. And I, I and anytime I do one and not both, uh, it, I don't feel the work is working well for me. Yeah, I was, I was uh, you probably don't know this, I was in a punk rock band when I was younger and I was, I was really into grunge as well. So I think we're about the same age. And yeah, I mean, I was a musician. Were, were you a musician ever? I was, yeah, I was a heavy metal vocalist actually. <laughs> really? And a, and a grunge and metal, and then later a metal band uh, as a vocalist, yeah. I was a bass player and uh, a guitarist in another band. And I did sing in one band, but not very well. <laughs> <laughs> I was so, in a kind of a toolish, it was kind of a tool like uh, hard rock metal ish band. So, yeah, very proggy, but also kind of like grungy and punky. Yeah. I mean, of course, the last podcast I recorded was with uh, Samuel Andrea. Hmm. And we talked a lot about the relationship between music and poetry. And uh, I'm, I write a lot of formal poetry, so I think about rhythms a lot. And of course, grunge music is really interesting for that. So it, it had this strange fascination with unusual time signatures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or, or even like more progish metal, uh, you know, will kind of cycle around that as well. I remember, uh, but, but, but one thing I've always found like interesting with, uh, I don't know, like that I, always attend to with the stuff I'm working on is even if I'm writing a free verse poem I want like a certain rhythmic pattern in phrases so like I'll rewrite like lines again and again and again even in a free verse poem where I don't necessarily have a metrical pattern I'll just move into it all of a sudden at a certain point so like uh, what I find is I'll just like have um so, so I did a poem about Psycho about the Hitchcock film Psycho uh in the politics of knives and it's, you know, a series of prose poems that have no, you know, rhyme scheme, the no metrical pattern, nothing like that. Um, but then all of a sudden, the second last one is, uh, has a rhythmical rhyme scheme, 
it's very much it's still written like a prose poem but it um if you were to just read it aloud it reads like you know four stanzas uh, of four lines each that have a clear pattern and uh clean rhyme scheme and so on uh, i find like that movement like in and out of those more controlled spaces to be really uh interesting because i'm very interested in unsettling uh readers like what my core interest fundamentally um is th to set up a pattern and then break the pattern uh and that's sort of so as soon as i've got like any pattern at all uh, set up in whatever way and as soon as i feel the reader has caught the pattern i want to just out of nowhere break it and shift them in a new direction and then set up some new thing and then start breaking and shifting that like uh, i'm very interested in that kind of disorienting uh experience uh for, so it's for sort for of self-sabotage in a way it's very much a marketing nightmare i think <laughs> when people have to try to sell these books or what have you but uh yeah i feel like um i don't I, i'm very again like I remember reading this weird quote uh, from years and years ago, the Paris Review, you know, ha who has all these interviews with the writers, usually like this highly literary, you know, uh, well-respected, you know, high art novelists and poets. One year, the Paris Review decided to interview Stephen King. And I'm not sure when this was precisely. I think it was uh, after he'd won a major award or what have you, but... They decided to be Stephen King, and he said an interesting thing in it, which was that he he always saw the kind of book that he was writing as a book that was an unsafe space that was trying to hurt the reader. <laughs> uh, and it it was curious to me because on one hand, I think that's the opposite of what people say when they read Stephen King. Like the enduring explanation for King's popularity has always been whatever horrible things are happening in his story, you feel like this narrator is with you and is like a comfortable, casual voice that is carrying you forward. And, you know, so in some ways it was the literal opposite of everything that, uh, of most of the commentary I'd seen on his work. So is this weird sort of moment where it's like, well, if this is his stated goal, it seems like he's just constantly failing, uh, which is kind of curious to me. Um, but on the other hand, I also thought like, well, that's to me fundamentally an artistic goal is to s shake people out of their patterns. And I, again, that kind of Shiklovsky-esque um, idea that uh, the goal of art is to defamiliarize uh, and, you know, to, to use the, and all these techniques are defamiliarization techniques. Uh, and kind of fundamentally what you're trying to do to a reader is a sort of conceptual violence and break their ideas of how things are. Um, and that's why they're in the artwork, in a manner of speaking, or that's, you know, your definition of artwork on a basic level. T to me, um, this thing that it, you know, is capable of a conceptual violence and of kind of taking and reorganizing your accepted ideas uh, about how things are. Uh, and so for that reason, I've, I've always been interested in horror uh, as a genre which i think is very much about reality and how do you break reality uh what if reality operated uh fundamentally differently from what, what we accept as reality and, and i've also just i think it explains in some ways my attraction to that uh, kind of technical approach of you know wanting to kind of set up patterns and then shift and break the patterns and then reset them and break them and i just find that disorienting moment uh really fascinating and interesting this is yeah this is really interesting i'm wondering now if i should uh because sometimes if i'm if i write a palindrome for example i just think oh, it's such a shame i can't use this word here instead and I'm quite tempted now to just do that. Just why not? So it, it would be generated using the same processes as all other palindromes, but the end result would not be a palindrome. I'd have broken free of that restriction. Maybe. I remember a Christian book once telling me that the best uh, whatever, like constrained poem to him was maybe I'm putting words in his mouth. So, you know, he can maybe, I'll just like say, 
I maybe I'm remembering this wrong and he didn't say it. <laughs> but my memory uh, of talking to Christian about this kind of thing was for him, the best uh, constrained work was uh, the work you didn't realize was constrained. So he was used the example of um, a void by uh, Parekh. Uh, and how some of the early original, um, you, so that you've got this kind of mystery novel without the letter E. Uh, and apparently uh, a number of the early reviewers just reviewed it as a mystery novel that had no constraint uh, recognizable in it whatsoever. And, and I remember Christian saying something like that was to him, like the kind of goal on a certain level was to have all these massive constraints, but then be able to be so deathless um, that people don't recognize that you're operating with constraints. And so where, um, and then maybe, you know, a notes page, like you've got in your books, these notes pages that kind of um, explain, well, here's a constraint that was operating that in case you didn't catch it. <laughs> you know, I mean, of course, if you call the poem like Frankenstein's sonnet or something, and like it's different, we can tell from the title, but, um, or like, you know, that's a form that's very familiar. But I think like where maybe, the kind of work you're doing is most successful is uh, you know, when it's, I have to go to the notes because I can't necessarily tell exactly what you're doing because it's been so deftly accomplished. But I, I remember Christian like sort of saying something like that to me, like the best, you know, yeah. whatever. I remember stories about Parekh being, being mm -hmm. very happy to have a bad review because at least they didn't notice. Yeah. <laughs> they did, the, the reviewer didn't like the novel, but he didn't notice the constraint. Yeah, I find like reviews are an interesting sort of whole other subject, but I find like the ones that I enjoy the most, whether they're positive or negative, are the ones that just they kind of are grasping what I'm doing. Um, and uh, I get very disappointed in reviews that even if they're positive, just don't seem to understand what I've done. But that's my fault yeah. in many respects. <laughs> well, but how, I also like feel. How do you feel about explanatory notes? You know, I I, I typic I used to be against them, and then my daughter basically talked me into putting them into the book. So my new book has uh, some explanatory notes, although I kind of minimize them a little bit. Um, I used to be very much against them, but uh, what I realized, like with my my daughter, kind of reading drafts of the manuscript and stuff, she would ask me questions, and I would say, oh well, you know, that's because of this. Again, I was making like an assumption that somebody would know something and they wouldn't necessarily know it. And I feel like you shouldn't have to understand all the illusions in a poem, for example, to get something out of that poem. But certainly it would help to like have, you know, the illusion handy. <laughs> so I kind of like started, I've changed my thinking on it a lot. And now I appreciate like a well um, crafted notes section. Um, if only because we're in an age of media fragmentation and there's no common knowledge anymore. Like when I was growing up, there were still only a handful of TV channels and stuff. And you all knew this, you all knew certain things, like people had common knowledge. And I don't feel like that is the case anymore for good and for ill. You cannot, uh, I find it hard when I'm teaching university classes because I cannot trust that they all have heard of Adam and, Adam and Eve. I can't trust they all know who Hitler is necessarily. Like you would think maybe, like they don't all know that the Cold War happened. Like things that used to be common knowledge are not. Uh, and so the good side of it is people have this more specialized knowledge. You can have like say a group of people that collectively know a lot deeply about a lot of different things in a way that you didn't have before and aren't necessarily all kind of, you know, uh, drawing on the same pool of knowledge, but have this diversity, uh, and you have the strength of that diversity. But the downside of it, I think, is that, like in a classroom, people don't have the basis and the foundation that uh, that you used to be able to rely upon, and so you have to kind of build up the scaffolding all the time. So I find in classrooms, I have to like do things like, you know, define what a sentence is. Uh, before I can start getting into how, how to write a strong sentence or, or what have you. Like I have to like explain, you know, a biblical reference if there's, before we can analyze a text that it has this biblical reference, say. Um, so there's good and bad to doing that. Like it's just long, it takes more time. It's hard to do in a classroom where like you're trying to, you know, uh, 
how do you get into a complex text that has a lot of referencing of these external things um, when and you just can't rely on people to even know like you know who, who these things are like I mean people who don't know who the prime minister is yeah. uh, you know and it's and they're not dumb people it's just for whatever reason you know that's just outside of their purview and who know you know it's just it, it's not like it used to be in that sense and so I think that it's um, w when you kind of come to like, should I have a notes section like that more <laughs> side of the book? I feel like it's it's kind of more necessary than it used to be, particularly if you want to break out of like the 10 people who already read all this stuff and maybe try to interest, you know, people who would really like this work given the chance or like find something interesting in it uh, enough that they would maybe want to read a notes section. Uh, yeah. Does that make sense? So I, I've kind of come around to thinking I, it's a good idea, whereas I was very against them before. It is difficult to know when to stop, though. Like you don't know, end up over explaining everything. I stopped and because I, I, my publisher told me, you know, you can either add six pages to this or cut two pages. <laughs> like that's sort of like at a certain point, you know, I, I was like, okay, I'm getting too long with this note section. Uh, and I, it, you know, but. But yeah, I, I feel like when I look back at Ex Machina, I kind of wish I had a note section in there a little bit. But part of that book is to just frustrate you and make you uh, and just break away from standard ways the book works. So I think for that book, it didn't really make a lot of sense. But I have a handful of like quick little notes of like, here's where this thing comes from. Like, here's the quote. If it's got a quote, for example, I cite the quote. Um, Clockfire, I have. I think no notes other than like thanks this person thanks that person um and i don't know if that book needs notes necessarily but it you know i feel like um in my new book the national gallery i, I again i start to do some more strange things so i felt like some of them were worth explaining and some of them weren't worth explaining i kind of always am thinking like what is the i i kind of have the poe approach in a in respect of like I want to start with the affect. Like, what's the thing I want this person to be thinking or feeling when they're done? And sometimes it's confusion or frustration. <laughs> so in those cases, like, the notes are going to be counter, right, uh, to that experience. Uh, so I'll I'll make it even... So in those scenarios, instead of explaining something in a note, I'll make it more confusing in the next draft, or more frustrating. I'll put a title that doesn't seem to have any reference to the poem whatsoever and what have you but then other times these you know these notes are really useful you're making yourself sound a bit sadistic there but i think i but i do feel like there's a certain sadism in art in the sense not like a a, a in the sense of like again trying to do a conceptual violence but i think like ultimately like it's not a sadistic move uh, so much as you know this kind of weirdly um uh, I don't know. I think like everybody will be helped <laughs> by breaking out of these unhelpful patterns that we're in. That and the positive, sense. the positive spin as well is that you're you're leaving Easter eggs for people to discover themselves. So that's a yeah, that's nice that's, that's actually a great way to put it uh, as well. Like I, I I used to say, especially with Ex Machina, when when I was uh, when that book was new, I used to often say like I really want people to um, not just read my books but do things with them. So like I've released all my books, all my poetry books, I've released under Creative Commons licenses uh, to encourage people remixing the text or doing other, um, uh, again, kind of spinning off them in various ways. Ex Machina in particular, uh, for a while, it, it's been taught in a lot of art classrooms um, where, where students have had to say, like do weird projects, transforming the text or what have you to me that stuff's really exciting because again i want it to be an immersive visceral experience to read the book uh, and so to so i think that anything i can do to get uh, a reader actively engaged in the book um and not just kind of passively experiencing it to me is uh is the most is the thing that i'll do even if that and if I can't do it in another way, I'll do it in terms of confusion and frustration. <laughs> you know, I'd rather they throw the book against the wall because they hate this book so much uh, than just have a kind of neutral reaction to it.
Yeah. Well, with, with that in mind, uh, would you like to do some readings? Sure, absolutely. Maybe I'll read, uh, I'll read two poems from Clockfire for you if you want. Uh, so these are, again, Clockfire is uh, 77 plays that are impossible to produce. Uh, so it's a strange sort of book that's sort of inspired partly from like Yoko Ono's grapefruit and those sort of word paintings that, uh, you know, the, the fluxus, uh, you know, impossible happenings and so on. Uh, it also is very influenced by Calvino, uh, his Invisible Cities, and even in Weird Way by Lovecraft and his, um, again, these kind of cosmic horrors. Uh, so, again, plays that would be impossible to produce. This place called, this one I'm going to read here is called Eight Minutes. Um, if the sun exploded, it would take eight minutes for its last light to reach Earth, meaning that for eight minutes, one might look into the sky and see a sun that has already exploded. Armed with this fact, the director destroys the sun. The play transpires during the next eight minutes, performed by countless actors, the entire host of the planet's life, who continue on unaffected, unaware that the world they know is already gone, that a new world with new terrors rushes toward them at the speed of light. And then this is the mirrored stage. Again, this is, you know, a book of impossible plays. So a lot of them are circling around the theatrical experience uh, and trying to reimagine that or just, you know, exploit it in particular ways. So this is the mirrored stage. The lights dim, then come up as the curtain rises to reveal an empty stage, its back wall a giant mirror. The audience looks upon its own reflection, enraged. What pompousness. Betrayed, they file out. A joke has been played on them, an artless joke. Some have looked forward to this play all week. They mutter and complain. The play of failure, a ham-fisted attempt at profundity. They will warm, warn others and demand a refund. Finally, the theater is empty. Silence, then an eruption of applause. Although the audience has left, their reflections remain. These reflections rise, cheering, delighted, finally free. And you said you wanted the National Gallery? You wanted me to read the Moby Dick poem, right? Of course, yeah. Yes, so I really appreciate but, but your Moby what, Dick. As well, as well uh, why not, since we've talked about them, why not uh, Leatherface? Sure, sonnet? yeah, I can read some of those. I love the Leatherface sonnets in particular, just because I'm so obsessed with Czech Stance Massacre. But I know that your book has a uh, Moby Dick uh, you know, poem in there as well. Um, so this poem is a constrained one, uh, one I'm going to read. Uh, I'm something of a solid. What this is is... Uh, so, so in the notes section, this is explained again, but like this is all of the moments in the novel no Moby Dick where the word uh, salt appears uh, in sequence. So it's just, uh, I just pulled, you know, from the text, all of those uh, sentences in sequence. And I just sort of hacked, you know, I, the, I took a sentence and either hacked part of it off at uh, the front of the back or just left the full sentence, depending, you know, on how I felt it read. And then I just arranged it, uh, and then I introduced my stanza breaks. But otherwise, the text itself is the lines from Moby Dick. It's in the order that they appear in Moby Dick. It's called I Am Something With Salt, which is the first line. Uh, so the title is also uh, just beginning the poem, effectively. I Am Something With Salt. Once broiled, judiciously buttered, and judgmatically salted, that Himalayan salt sea Macedon, clothed with salted pork cut up into little flakes and plentifully seasoned with pepper and salt. Something of the salt sea yet lingered. There's a salt cellar of state. How they use the salt precisely, who knows? Distilled to a volatile salts for fainting ladies, bring on a great baron of salt junk. The three salt sea warriors would rise and depart with storm lashed guns on which the sea salt cakes, dismasting blasts as direful as any that lash the salted wave that salted down a lean missionary. The pepper and salt color of his head, the savage salt spray bursting down the forecastle scuttle, the salt breath of the newfound sea. For 40 years, I have fed upon dry salted fare by salt and hemp, most moldy and over salted death. I love that poem because uh, I love Moby Dick. Moby Dick's my favorite novel in the English language. Uh, and the weirdest novel, 
I think, in many respects, in the English language. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's a fascinating, definitely. strange book that's stranger than people expect. Um, so this sec this is from a section where most of the poems are uh, called mixed media, and most of the poems are constructed out of found materials in this way. I'll actually read one more poem from that section, if you don't mind, just sure. because it, has a, it ends with a quote from Donald Trump, which I think is... Um, ironic and uh, sad and also somewhat funny in these trying times. It's called Not Doing So Badly. I'm not doing so badly, something my friends deal with too. I'm not doing so badly, all told. I write things down. Nature is vast and glorious and generous and mean and small and shitty. It's important for a man to know himself. He's not doing so badly for a start. Korea's not doing so badly. Europe's not doing so badly now. Artists aren't doing so badly. They suffer only 8% unemployment. Turn that around, and it's really good news. I'm not doing so badly. I'm relatively safe compared to my neighbors in hell. The poem is not doing so badly so far, but I'm not sure if my ending will work. I'm not doing so badly in attracting readers to the brand. They miss mom, but they're not doing so badly at all. We spent many productive hours there laughing together. She's not doing so badly in bed. It's a hard job at a tough industry. He's not doing so badly, not for somebody who is incredibly angry and miserable. Things are going better than I feared. I can't be doing so badly because I'm president and you're not. <laughs> it's quite great. the poem these days. Uh, and then it's just a couple of Leatherface poems. So uh, again, these are kind of strange uh, sonnets, some more strict than others. Uh, I'll read my favorite two, which are at the end. One's less strict and one's more strict. So this is called Throne. And this is referring to a moment in Texas Chainsaw Massacre where the main, the final girl, as it were, wakes up and has, there's a great visual joke in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre where her, she's in a chair that's made out of like human, half constructed from human corpses. So her hands are like tied to this other person's hands. <laughs> like her forearms like strapped to the armchairs armrests are arms so it's just a silly like weird little piece of black humor inside the film but anyway this is you know it's, and they're and they're the other face is now at this point in a uh, domestic mask uh not the killer's mask but a domestic sort of mask he has wearing a dress he's got pearls on he's done up uh he's made this meal for her and he's playing host and he has his makeup on and he's trying to be a good host in many respects so this is called throne you wake into your story, hands bound to severed hands, wrist upturned for kind knives that never come. In front of you, dead friends make up your meal. Light shines, burns through one mask, another black mask bleeds darkness. A table laid with flesh for you, everything for you, you are their guest. You are sitting on the throne. You would give them anything, even your soul, if you could stand, if they would let you close your eyes. But no one wants your soul, just open eyes. This meal was made for you. You are the guest. You are sitting on the throne. And then this final uh, poem here is uh, at the end of the film, when she gets away, you know, the other face does a strange interpretive dance. <laughs> so this is, you know, called, it's just titled Interpretive Dance of the Chainsaw Accompaniment. Behind the mask, Leatherface is gone. He does his work, serves father, serves him well turns flesh to subline sculptures. He has done what he was made to do, the supper bell. He reigns supreme, not knowing that he reigns, just knowing this is his house, they trespass. He knows they will be tasty. He knows pain, but does not know their pain. The chainsaws rasp, the music and the partner to his dance. He rages as she flees, a furious sway. Another life offers another chance. Sequels grant all things to those who wait. He vows she won't escape his blade next time. His illness separates him from his crimes. Thank you. So th these are from National Gallery. Yes. Uh, published by Coach House. Yes, Coach House. Uh, both those books, the National Gallery and Clockfire, are from Coach House. And uh, but although the book you can get for free on my website, Ex Machina, is also in print from Book Hug. Jonathan, it's been great talking to you. Thanks so much for coming on. Oh, thanks very much. It's nice talking to you. To discover more, visit us at pentrackpress.com.